Coming to you from Studio A here at Proven Winners Color Choice Shrubs, it's time for the Gardening Simplified Show with Stacy Hervella, me, Rick Weist, and our engineer and producer, Adriana Robinson. Okay, today we get to talk about pruning and obviously herbaceous material like your perennials. Well, we pruned them up and cleaned them up last fall, and if there's still some left like ornamental grasses, we can cut them back now. But when we talk about pruning as we get to the vertumnal time of the year. And vertumnal? I just, yeah, I threw that in there, <laughs> Stacy, because okay. autumnal rolls off the tongue, but a lot of people don't know of that 17th century word that pertains to spring, vertumnal. So yeah, I've never heard that, that word. I hadn't either. That's why I threw it in. I All think right. it's interesting. So really, the question is, when is the best time of year to prune my trees, and my shrubs. And the reason people can sometimes get confused or hesitate is because pruning requirements of trees and shrubs will not only vary according to the species, but also depend on the purpose of the pruning. And Stacy, if I had a dime for every time someone has asked me about how to prune a buddleia or a hydrangea, or a clematis, I'd be a rich guy. Oh, yeah. Those are three big stumpers right there. (laughs) Oh, good one. Big stumpers. (laughs) Yes. As a matter of fact, uh, my word of the day, hag snare. Oh. Hag snare. There's another lost word found in the internet archive. It's a stub off which wood has been cut. Oh. There you go. You can add that one to your portfolio. Uh, So what's the secret? And I'm... Stealing this one from Stacy, what's the secret of transitioning from a competent gardener to a confident one? Pruning. I'd suggest you watch Stacy's video and also Stacy, uh, you produce something called Pruning Demystified, and it's a web page that we'll link at gardeningsimplifiedonair.com. It is uh, it is excellent, Stacy, because again, many times people become paralyzed knowing that they should prune, afraid to prune because I'm going to kill the thing or I'm going to mess it up. It's so true. People sort of have this vague notion that gardening or even just having a landscape requires pruning. So they know these two concepts, but they don't know how they go together. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, I think a lot of people will drive around, they'll see, uh, you know, landscapes at gas stations, mm-hmm. and they'll see those things pruned <laughs> to within an inch of their lives. And they'll say, that is a well-maintained landscape. <laughs> That's what my landscape should look like. If it does, everyone knows that I care. And I'm taking care of my plants and that's what it should look like. And so that's not the case at all. I mean, Mm -hmm. pruning is done for specific purposes. A pruned landscape does not equal a well-maintained landscape. It does not equal a beautiful landscape, certainly. Um, But pruning is a very powerful gardening tool. And I think for myself, you know, that, that thing that I wrote that you said in Pruning Demystified, that it's transitioning from a competent gardener to a confident one, when you do prune properly and when you see how what you've pruned has impacted the plant's growth, yes, it really just kind of distills it all and it really starts to make sense for you. And so that's why it's so important to understand what you're doing and not just go out there willy-nilly and just say, okay, everything looks cared for, I pruned it. I mean, that's just, you know. It's all about making sense, exactly. And Stacy, I'm in your camp because you have always said, don't prune without a reason. Never. So why do we prune? Well, the reason we prune is to improve flowering and fruiting, even stem color on plants like dogwood, improve the plant's habit or shape, encourage reblooming, neaten a plant's appearance, rejuvenate it, or maybe if you're really getting into pruning, forming a hedge or some sort of topiary, but always prune with a reason. And with that, Stacy, I threw together a very short limerick to share with you on pruning because it causes so much worry for people. Old wood, new wood, dead wood, my, to prune or not to prune, I ask why. Height and length to measure, I'm really feeling the pressure. Do I take action or do I just stand by? Ooh, People ask themselves that in the garden all the time, right? And you take something like hydrangeas or buddleias, the fear is I'm going to damage the plant or I'm going to reduce flowering by pruning. And as we leave winter and head into spring, 
there is that risk that you could prune out flowers with some plants. Right. And there is that risk. Now, that is a risk. That is a disappointment, certainly, for someone who does that. And that's why we always say, when in doubt, don't prune. Mm -hmm. If you don't prune something, it's a lot easier to recover from not pruning than from over pruning. And, you know, it's just, if you don't know why you're pruning then you don't know what to do. You don't know how much to cut. You don't know where to make your cuts. That reason why you are pruning literally informs every other decision that you're going to make in that pruning project. So I would say if you don't have that initial reason, then do stand by. Yeah. Then do put the pruners down. Um, either leave it alone, write a message to the Gardening Simplified Show. Maybe we'll be able to help you. Read some articles online, ask a gardening friend, but, you know, try to determine that reason and then you can make your decision. And if that happens next year, that's perfectly fine. Yeah. Pruning is ne is rarely an issue of like, if I don't prune this, the plant is going to die. Um, it's really an aesthetic nicety. I mean, unless, of course, it's like a damage, which we've had a ton of damage sure. this year with all of that cold, heavy, wet snow. You know, if you have a hanging limb, well, then all of this goes out the window. <laughs> but in terms of maintaining your landscape... When in doubt, don't prune. As they say in broadcasting, please stand by. The opinions here are not the fault of your receiver. They're just our opinions. And Stacy, for me, what I hate to see with pruning, there's nothing like a plant having a bad hair day where somebody just takes a little off the top. Now, I think taking a little off the top, sometimes it's necessary, but most of the time we are far better off, again, going in with a reason. Because when we prune back on a branch, it forces outward growth. It makes the plant fuller or forces blooming. In some cases, we take a branch all the way out as opposed to taking a little off the top. But as I drive out and about in neighborhoods or when I'm out running, I see it all the time. Plants where just a little has been taken off the top. And it drives me nuts. Yeah, it's it's not my jam. It is not my <laughs> style. Um, and I don't, it's, it's you're, you're just asking yourself, why did someone do this? Even yeah. if you do want to height control your plant, you want it to be shorter. You know, you're not going to give it the buzz cut. You want to get out there with your hand pruners and, and make individual cuts. Don't just take your head strip trimmer and, you know, cut it flat so it has a buzz cut. You want to cut out selectively to maintain a more natural look, especially when you're just pruning the top. Yeah. Maybe it goes back to my childhood because I look at pictures now when I was very young and I think my mom put a pot on my head and just cut my hair that way. But it was cheap. So it was, uh, it was easy. Uh, you know, time of the year is a critical issue. In summer, I like to do some maintenance pruning, but in general, step away from the pruners. Early in spring, uh, you know, grapevines are a great example. People will prune grapevines very hard during the months, months of February and March. Uh, so Early spring or late winter, in ideal time, because also, Stacy, there's no insect or disease activity. We get a good look at the plant, and we do a better job of pruning. You know, it's such a good time to get that, you know, good look at the structure of the plant. Very often, you can see where the buds are emerging or are going to emerge, which also helps you make the right decisions. So I think it's a great time. There are a few things, except, of course, for those who bloom on old wood, which, you know, Got plenty of detail for that, uh, you know, on that for you to, to determine that. There's few things that aren't best pruned in early spring while they're still somewhat dormant. Yeah, exactly. Lilacs are one of the first plants that yep. comes to mind. Not pruning lilacs or forsythia, for but in general, those spring bloomers, I like to prune them right after they're done blooming. You know, on a future show, Stacy, we'll talk about the topic of tools, but I do want to mention in this segment, get yourself a good high quality, clean bypass pruners. Not one of those mashers, nope. but a bypass pruner. Um, as long as you don't lose it, and I do lose them. Sometimes I find them with a lawnmower, but I do lose them. Still, spend some money and get a good pruner. You know, it's so worth it. Your hands will thank you. Your plants will thank you. And those mashers, they're called anvil pruners. And the issue with those, of course, they don't make a nice clean cut. They smash the wood. 
but they're much cheaper than the bypass yes. pruners. So when people, especially beginning gardeners or people on a budget, go to the garden center to buy those pruners, they just say, well, this is pruners. This is 10 bucks or 20 bucks cheaper than the other ones. And they end up with the wrong pruner. Anvil pruners are often used by foresters because they stay sharp and they're just doing like, you know, different kinds of work. They're fine if you're doing cut flowers. But in terms of pruning from your actual landscape plants, a bypass pruner with a scissor action, there's no other choice. Yeah, in general, you'll find those cheap pruners at the checkout along with the candy bars for impulse per purchases. <laughs> so get to the tool section and spend some dough on that bypass pruning shears. Plants on Trial coming up next here on the Gardening Simplified Show. Greetings, gardening friends, and welcome back to the Gardening Simplified Show. It's time where we put a plant on trial, which is to say we're going to tell you about one of the 320-plus Proven Winners Color Choice shrubs, and you get to decide if it's going to earn a spot in your garden or landscape or not. Now, I'm going to have to come right out and say that today's plant on trial is a fabulous one. It's Rise Up Lilac Day's Rose. I like that. And you know what? I can see why you picked it because in the previous segment, I mentioned hydrangeas and buddleia, but when it comes to pruning, roses. Yeah. I mean, I think roses are the thing. People think roses, they think pruning, even more so than almost anything else, any other kind of plant. And I wanted to pick Rise Up Lilac Days because it is, uh, the Rise Up series are the first ever climbing roses from Proven Winners Color Choice Shrubs. And I'm going to get into that in a minute, but it's going to take me a long time to kind of build up to that because of course, you know, I like to tie the plant into the topic of the day and sure. it's pruning and spring is for pruning. People get real antsy. Uh, they want to do the right thing. And again, people just think roses need to be pruned. And that is true. And it, I, I have found in my own personal gardening journey that when I read about pruning roses, when I learned about the how and why of pruning roses, as we said in the first segment, things just really crystallized for me. Mm -hmm. And that was knowledge I was able to see and apply across other plants as well. Now, I do want to first say that, you know, we're talking about pruning. We, we talk a lot about shrubs on the show, but really all types of plants can be pruned for different reasons. So annuals, you know, you might give your annuals a trim in the middle of the summer to kind of shorten them, make them a little bit, uh, reinvigorate them. A pinch to grow an inch. A pinch to grow an inch. Deadheading is mm -hmm. a type of pruning. So if yeah. you're deadheading geraniums or something else, that is actually also a type of pruning. People prune their perennials. I know when I was a rooftop gardener in New York City, uh, the designer that I was working for liked to have his hostas pruned. Mm. He didn't like them to have as many leaves as they were supposed to have. He wanted more space. Interesting. So I would go in there and I would yank out hosta leaves. And that was also a type of pruning. Now, of course, we're going to talk about shrubs and trees. Those are a totally different technique with a different approach. But when it comes to shrubs, I think roses really do represent all of the benefits and reasons why you might prune something. So the reason that we prune roses so regularly and why they have this association with pruning is because if you do not prune a rose, what happens is the growth gets really, really tall. It gets really, really skinny and you just get a few kind of wimpy flowers way up there at the tippy top. So it's not going to look anything like the pictures that you see on our plant tags or on our website. It's not going to have that big, beautiful rose, rose bush light rose bush look that people like so much. Now, if you prune a rose, what you do is you do two things. You take off that apical bud, the top bud, which produces hormones, which stifles the growth of anything below it. So it, you keep it from just wanting to grow upward ever skinnier. And by taking off that top bud, which was produced later in the previous season, when the days were getting shorter and cooler, you're taking the growth back to thicker, sturdier, more vigorous buds that were created much earlier in the season when the growing season was ideal. You know, back in June, July, the days are long, hot, and those thicker buds are going to result in thicker, more vigorous growth, which is going to be stronger, more supportive. It's going to look better. And most importantly, it's going to flower better. Have you ever pruned a rose? And some of the growth that came after your pruning was thin and spindly and weak, and some of it was thick and vigorous. Sure. The reason for that is the size of the bud that you pruned back to. People get so confused by this. You know, I thought I did the right thing. Some of the growth is skinny. The thicker the bud that you prune back to, the 
so you, you make your cut above a bud, the thicker that bud is, the thicker and more vigorous the growth that comes from it is. So with roses, we really want to prune them at a time when those buds just start to emerge and you can really clearly see where those buds are, how thick they are and make that cut. And then when you see the ensuing growth from those cuts, that's, I think, when it really all starts to make sense for people. That's fabulous advice. You rose to the occasion, Stacy. And when I first started out in the garden center industry, they always told us to prune back to the first five leaflet on the stem. To me, that really doesn't make sense. I like what you're saying there. Yeah, I don't do the leaflet thing. No, and, neither and, do I. And I also I don't, don't know why they taught me that. <laughs> well, you know, there's a lot of, of a lot of pruning practices, especially that have been tossed out the window exactly. since back in the day. You know, I know even when I was learning to garden, you know, back in like the 1990s, people were still saying, "Oh, well, you must." make the rose cut away from the bud so the water drains away from it. And when I went to horticulture school, the instructor was like, are you joking me? Do you see buds rotting everywhere? Because when nature makes a pruning cut, it's not at a slant. Exactly. And buds aren't rotting out. And um, as I've said before on the show, when you are pruning off the plant, you do want to minimize the surface area of the wound. You want to leave a smaller wound that's easier for the plant to heal from. If you make a big, long, slanted cut, that's a lot more surface area. Stacy, haven't many of these rules been thrown out the window because today in the golden age of plant breeding these plants are more vigorous they're fabulous like the plant you're featuring today there's that yeah a lot and, and that does uh help a lot but a yeah. lot of these you know we've just realized they're just they're just not true they're just yeah. little things that probably people put into their gardening books to make you buy them and think that they were hex. giving you a little yeah hex, <laughs> give you something a little bit extra but the other reason that i don't like cutting back to the the five leaflet is in my opinion if you are waiting until the rose has actually leafed out and is not still in bud, then the rose just wasted all of that energy uh, uh, expanding those buds into leaves that you're just going to cut off. Great now, it's not going to harm the plant. These are all like best practices right. kind of things. Um, so if you wait, if you do it when they're still in bud, the plant doesn't put energy into leafing those out. The energy within the roots and the plant's vascular system can be concentrated into the much smaller amount of buds that you have left on on the plant and that you have is a much really better smart. Plant. That so is really smart. That's my approach to that. Now, um, oh man, I had so many things I wanted to say about pruning, and I'm not going to have time. And this is like it's like torture to try to get this all into ten little minutes and tell you about the fabulous Rise Up Lilac Days Rose. Now. All of the approach to pruning roses is going to be the same. So everything that we're talking about, you know, early spring, um, pruning back to a thick and vigorous bud, that's going to be the same no matter what type of rose you have. The differences are going to come depending on those types of roses. So with something like a shrub rose, you can actually prune that thing with like a hedge trimmer, a chainsaw. It's not real fussy. If you have something like a hybrid tea, you're probably going to be a lot more delicate and purposeful about where you make those cuts. Sure. And with something like a climbing rose, like Rise Up Lilac Days, then you're going to use a similar strategy, but you have to understand that climbing roses do not climb on their own. So they're not like a clematis, they're not like a climbing hydrangea, they're not like ivy, where they are able to climb up on something on their own. Basically, what they are, are roses that have naturally long, flexible canes, and they still, still have thorns, so they can cling somewhat, but that gives them the ability to be trained onto a structure. Sure. So, you know, you're not going to, you're going to have to do a little bit of work to get a climbing rose to actually climb, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't prune it because what happens, people worry, Hey, I finally got my climbing rose to cover this thing. Now you're telling me I'm going to prune it like crazy. As we've said on the show, when you have an established plant, you have a big vigorous root system, which acts as an engine to fuel that growth. So the more established your root system is, the more vigorously it is going to recover from that pruning. So you're still going to want to prune your climbing roses. Of course, they can get to a point where they're very difficult to prune, but you want to make sure that you are taking off that top growth. Otherwise, what you're going to have is a climbing rose with just a few spindly little flowers at the tippy top that you can't even enjoy. You're not going to get that amazing Cape Cod rose covered cottage look that you want by, by growing a climbing rose. You're just going to have like 
10 sad flowers and they're going to be at the top. Stacy, I'm realizing we're going to have to do about three or four shows on the rose topic alone. <laughs> we could, we could. <laughs> I know it's like, I wish I could say so much more, but I do want to talk about rise up lilac days specifically. So it is a, what we call a mini climber. So other climbing roses are going to be, maybe have canes that are 10, 15 feet more uh, tall, long. Whereas Rise Up Lilac Days and the other roses in the Rise Up series are about five to eight feet tall. Mm. So this is an ideal size for planting on like a porch pillar, um, pergolas, deck railings, things like that. Of course, maybe a deck railing isn't so good because they do have thorns, but um, any place you're not going to have to have your hands. Um, so it's, it's a really nice scale. And I think that's important. It's not going to take over your house. It's not going to become a maintenance nightmare. It's just going to give you that beautiful column of flowers. And the flowers on this plant, you have to see them to believe them. They are purple. And, uh, you know, a lot of roses, um, color kind of gets a little bit maybe exaggerated. They are a true kind of lilac purple. And the fragrance, if you smell this plant, oh, yeah. it is absolutely yeah. stunning. Um, you know, we love roses that have all the disease resistance and vigor that we want in Proven Winners Color Choice Shrubs, but with fragrance and with amazing color. And this plant does that. Now, if you don't have a place to grow a climbing rose, don't fret because this is a mini climber. You can actually grow it as a shrub rose. It doesn't strictly need the support. It just can be used that way. So I really love that versatility because when you see this plant in the garden center this year, you are going to want to have one for your own garden. I can guarantee you that. And if you want to see the pictures of it, you can visit us at gardeningsimplifiedonair.com or check us out on Instagram. Or of course, uh, if you're watching the YouTube version, you're going to see all the fabulous footage that Adriana cuts in so you can see it for yourself and decide if it is going to earn a spot in your garden. Rise up lilac days, rose. We're going to take a little bit of a break. When we come back, we've got the garden mailbag to open up. So please stay tuned. Greetings, gardening friends, and welcome back to the Gardening Simplified Show. I have to confess, I was quite the rambling rose in Plants on Trial, <laughs> talking about Rise Up uh, Lilac Day's rose. So there was a lot of information. I didn't even get out half the information that I wanted to get out. So please do check out our show notes at gardeningsimplifiedonair.com. They're gonna, I'm going to put in everything that I said, everything that I didn't say, <laughs> link to the um, page of Rise Up Lilac Day's Rose so you can see it for yourself. And we'll also have resources there for you because, you know, we want you to be successful. You bet. And that's why we have the garden mailbag so people can write us their questions. And it is definitely getting to the time of year where people are worried. We have unusual warmth this spring, so people are freaking out about all sorts of stuff to varying degrees and um, you know thinking ahead to the season and, and remembering things that they need to, to deal with that happened last year so what uh what do we got in the mailbag this time yeah with an el nino winter as a matter of fact i'm going to be on the uh, nbc affiliate here in west michigan this week talking about that fact that stuff is popping out of the ground and one of our youtube viewers also asked us which is probably on a lot of people's minds my day lilies are are emerging already zone 5 b 6a do i need to cover them when it freezes again daffodils daylilies popping out of the ground stacy they are and you know i think that uh it's not a cause for concern there are certainly things that are sensitive to cold if we have a warm snap and they start to emerge that tends to be more shrubs there's yes. certainly perennials that are susceptible to that but daylilies are not one of them. And daylilies are naturally very early to emerge. And just because that's happening now in late February instead of late March, as it would under a more normal spring or winter, um, doesn't mean that they can't make it. You know, it's they plants emerge based on day length and warmth. And right now the days are getting longer. And so, you know, to some extent, you, you, the plants know what they're doing. <laughs> you know, they're, they're being sure. triggered. And yeah, we could have some cold snaps, but that could happen in April. And it has happened when, you know, even when the daylilies are emerging under more normal conditions. Sure. And remember that part of the reason they're emerging is soil temperature. There is not frost in many areas in the ground where normally we would have frost. Now the question, should I cover them? Stacy, I say, no, don't cover them. Now, for some people who have plants that are growing too quickly because of early spring weather, I have had folks who have shaded the plants, mm -hmm. put up a little block, create shade, the sun still somewhat low in the south, and that has helped slow the growth. But I would say in the case of daylilies, 
don't worry about it. Yeah, you can't kill them. You can't kill them. <laughs> I mean, you really can. You can try. And also, they are so tough and vigorous. They have so much energy stored up in their roots that yes. it's really not a problem. And and I think that people, now, if you're one of the listeners who are saying, well, wait a minute, I'm in zone 5B6A and my day lilies aren't emerging. Should I be concerned? What you're going to see very often is that plants that are near your home yes. are going to emerge a lot earlier than plants that are further away from your home. Your home kind of creates a little microclimate. It's a little bit warmer. So it's not necessarily a cause for concern. It's normal for daylilies to be early. If you are going to have an unusually cold uh, snap or frost or freeze and you're concerned, it's not a problem to go out there and drape an old towel or blanket or something like that. Not not plastic. Use something cloth. So if you're concerned, you can do it. But I don't think it's it, that you need to. And uh, they'll still be okay. Aaron writes to us, uh, oh, and let's tackle this issue. We're going to talk about chiggers. I call them red bugs. The chiggers have made being outside in the garden really difficult to do with miserable bites, even with a good layer of bug spray. The garden center recommends diatomaceous earth, but we have a large yard and garden reapplying is intensive, expensive. Uh, I'd really prefer not to use an insecticide. Um, there are a few insecticides out there to kill chiggers. So are there specific plants I should target? What do I do? What other bugs eat chiggers? Boy, I feel your pain, Aaron. Yeah, it's awful. Now, I have to say, I don't know anything about chiggers. So Aaron's comment sent me into a chigger deep dive, and I've <laughs> learned more and seen more about chiggers than I had ever hoped to see. Um, oh, their bites are horrible. They are horrible. And as a matter of fact, years ago, there was an entomologist that gave me this uh, limerick oh. about chiggers. It's real short. The thing called a chigger is really no bigger than the smaller end of a pin. But the bump that it raises just itches like blazes, and that's where the rub sets in. Oh, yes. I can see that. Very accurate. Yeah, and they it's it's not a pretty situation. So um, I had to do a lot of research on this. I have not had chiggers. Um, now, I do want to say a couple of things, though. So first of all, I think that if you... Uh, I totally understand and respect and appreciate anyone who doesn't want to use pesticides. But I think when it does come down to a question of human life and, and health and well-being, sometimes we have to make exceptions. And I do want to say, if you do want to call a professional service, that chiggers are actually not insects. People think they're insects, but they're actually more closely related to spiders, scorpions, and ticks. So a lot of times, pesticides that will take care of chiggers are not actually going to harm any insects, true insects that you're trying to preserve. I know you, you care a lot about pollinators and want to preserve them. So I would say find a, a professional ask them what they use to treat chiggers, and then do your research on those chemicals to see if they have any impacts on the insects that you're trying to conserve. Now, if you do get that, you get your yard sprayed, um, remember that only the larval stage of, of chiggers will actually uh, bite you. No other life phase of the chigger causes any harm to humans. So it's kind of a, a brief window from when they hatch out in like early to mid spring until they feed on you or your pets or whatever, and then drop off and move on to their next life stage. So if you're able to get them in that stage, you won't have biting chiggers and you'll be able to take care of them. Um, keep your yard clean if possible of leaf litter. I know a lot of us like to leave the leaves for different mm -hmm. insects and stuff, but uh, the female chiggers, adults, lay their eggs in leaf litter. So if you're able to clean that out now or sometime within the next couple of weeks, you'll remove a lot of potential egg laying sites. They like shaded areas of soil better. So if you have areas where your plants are close together and it's creating a nice, cool, shady area for them to shelter in, put your diatomaceous earth there. You don't have to go dusting your entire yard to try to deal with them. Concentrate it into the types of areas where they are going to shelter. Yeah, and along that vein, Stacy, I would recommend uh, cutting back taller plants or grasses. Yeah. Check out your property. If you have a lot of tall grass surrounding the area, cut it back. It's going to make a difference. Uh, chiggers or red buds, uh, bugs also love raspberries and blackberries for some reason. Oh, really? Yeah, they like to hang out in a raspberry or blackberry patch. Mm. And then the other thing is tight clothes are not good. In other words, areas where your clothes are tight, the band mm. on your socks 
or waistband or the sleeve is generally where they'll get in, get comfortable, and do some damage. So think about that, too. Yeah, that's that's really good advice. Now, I do want to say um, if you have irrigation, leave it off for the season. They tend to prefer humid, moisture environments. So if you're able yeah. to keep your yard drier, that will certainly make them feel a lot less welcome. And the good news is that all of these measures, whether it's you know cutting back your ornamental grasses, um, preventing things from getting taller or overhanging your lawn, keeping your lawn shorter than maybe we would normally recommend for a healthy lawn, they can all be temporary until you take care of your infestation, and hopefully they won't come back. They don't fly. They just kind of hitchhike Correct. a ride, so you don't have to worry about them you know, descending in swarms again. If you're able to take care of this population in your yard right now by taking some of these more drastic measures, you should be able to protect yourself in the future, hopefully. But I would say you know, if it really is as bad as you're talking about and as bad as it sounds, I would say consider you know, talking with a professional, tell them your concerns, ask them what they're going to be using, do your research, then make those adaptations to your yard. That's an IPM approach right you there. You got it. In, in an upcoming show, we will be talking about IPM, Integrated Pest Management. Real quickly, uh, Stacy, Connie's asking you about a Winecraft black smoke bush where uh, some branches growing really tall and other branches uh, short. Wants to know about how far back to prune a smoke bush. Right. Now, Connie, this is such a great question because Connie also mentions that she bought a quart size yes. Winecraft black smoke bush. And this is a beautiful plant. Smoke bush is a very interesting plant. But the quart size is a size that we normally would sell to growers to grow on to a larger size. And then they would be doing a lot of pruning to build that plant. Right. When you buy that quart size, you need to take that opportunity to do the pruning yourself. Now, smoke bush, if you, especially if you look at them right now in the winter, a more mature one, they have a crazy growth habit. They look like they have like fireworks all over them. They do this weird branching thing. And so it's just a natural um, aspect of their growth is that they have a crazy growth habit. Mm -hmm. So I would say, Connie... Go ahead and hack that thing back. You're going to lose your flowers this year, hack but <laughs> not a big deal. I would cut yours back to about probably, you know, I saw they're, they're pretty tall, your stems, and we'll put the pictures in the show notes at gardeningsimplifiedonair.com. I would say cut it back to, you know, just about a foot or two. That's going to cause it to branch or wherever you want that branching to start. Cut it back, and then you'll kind of encourage that branching. If you don't encourage branching on a smoke bush, it's not going to do it until it gets really tall and unruly. I agree, Connie. Show that plant who's boss. Yep. Get those hack it. bypass pruners and <laughs> hack it down. So, thank you all so much for your questions. We're going to take a little bit of a break. When we come back, we have a special guest for Branching News. So please stay tuned. Welcome back to the Gardening Simplified Show. It's time for Branching News. Today on Branching News, an interview with our friend Don Snoink from Thornapple Woodlands. And Don always gets me excited about bees and nature and plants and all that type of thing. His enthusiasm is uh, fabulous. And Don, you sent me a picture the other day of uh, some maple trees that were well, dripping what you call sapsicles. It's maple syrup season. And in an El Nino year, has it been kind of different this year? Big time. Different is, is an understatement. <laughs> you know, usually we tap the trees uh, around the end of February. Uh, I like to say that March is maple syrup month in Michigan. Mm -hmm. But with a year like this, we may be finished oh, wow. by the middle of March, easily. Wow. wow! And the season started, the sap started running at the end of January this year. So how bizarre. Yeah, yeah. And then we see sapsicles. So on today's show, we talked about pruning. This is where a wound or a prune has taken place, uh, pruning has taken place. And now sapsicles start to form because... You know, we have this odd thing here in Michigan or in the Midwest where we can get the sun to shine and it gets very warm during the day and then it flash freezes at night. It gets very cold at night. It can be that that causes a sap sickle where the sap's been flowing during the day and then it gets cold at night and freezes. Or more likely even than that is this scenario where it's a 
below freezing day, let's say it's 30 degrees, for example, but the sun is out. Mm. So that warms up the tree because that bark is dark and it warms it up Mm -hmm. and it gets the sap flowing inside that tree. As the sap comes out the wound, whether it's a cut from a human cutting a branch or whether a branch broke off in a storm over the winter, the sap comes out of that cut, freezes, and it grows as the sap drips down there and freezes on that sapsicle. Wow. Wow. And be honest with me, Don, you would do exactly what I would do, right? You'd snap one off and taste it, right? (laughs) You better believe it. And you know what's fascinating to me is this. When you do that, immediately there's a sweetness. And then right away, that sweetness goes away. So it's almost like the sugar's on the outside or something. But here's what I am always curious about, too. Did we discover that there's sugar in there by grabbing a sapsicle and sticking it in our, in our mouth mm-hmm. years and years and years ago. How did this all start? Possibly that's one way Yeah, you know, it could have all begun. Another possibility, of course, is watching the squirrels because oh, yeah. squirrels love to bite into maple branches mm-hmm. and you see them having yeah. a grand old time up there just oh, yeah. drinking it all up and you say, hey, maybe they have the right idea. Maybe there's something good in there. <laughs> That's exactly right. Last year when we pulled our taps, we had still some weather where it froze at night, got warm during the day above freezing, made the sap flow from that hole that we vacated when we pulled out the spile, and I saw a squirrel go out there and drink from that area. (laughs) Pretty cool. Yeah, it is cool. That's great. So that proves that sapsicles came first, pancakes were invented after sapsicles, and I would guess that's how it works, (laughs) right, Don? Hey, if you say it, I agree. You sent me a video that we're going to share with our listeners and our viewers at GardeningSimplifiedOnAir.com or here on our YouTube edition of the show. And that is of bees just swarming in, uh, I think it was like mid-February. And of course, we're here in Michigan in an El Nino winter uh, inspired me, Don, and again, caused me to think, what effect does an El Nino winter have on, on these bees? Yeah, that's a, that's really a good question. And I think it, it it makes me wonder the same. First of all, I think the warmth during the days we get, we get more days above freezing that allows those honeybees to vacate the hive to actually fly outside. And then they defecate. We call that a cleansing flight Mm -hmm. where they don't go to the bathroom in the hive for you kids that are listening out there, but they hold it. And then when they get a chance to fly, they're going to go out and I'll see little brown, yellow dots on the snow. If there's snow on the ground, that's from their doing their thing out there and then they fly back to the hive so that interesting the, interesting yeah. so when you're on a long trip with the kids on the expressway it's it's like looking for a, a rest area where you can turn off right exactly wow. <laughs> and think of the relief for the bees so that's yeah. a, that's on the po- that's on the positive side for the bees now to me the negative side of having a warmer than normal winter is they go through more honey over the winter We've stored honey in that hive. Those bees need to heat that hive on the cooler days. Um, You know, they're keeping it 95 degrees. Wow. Wow. And they do that by shivering their thoracic muscle. That's the muscle they use to flap their wings, but they disconnect from their wings, keep vibrating that thoracic muscle. That generates heat, but they need a source of energy for that, and that's honey. Mm. So they need to eat more honey. Uh, they're probably going to go through more honey because they're more active. Mm. And that means because less it's warmer. Fun. Sorry, Don. Yeah. And that means less so I, for you, or does that mean that it, it starts to become more of a dire situation for the bees? It's more of the situation for the bees because we've harvested our honey already at the end of summer. And then we leave here where we live, Michigan, Uh, I leave 60 to 80 pounds of honey on the hives for the winter for the bees. Um, So in a, in a warmer winter, when we get days in the 50 degree range, I can go out to a beehive and lift the back of it, lift the sides, gauge how much honey is in there. 
And if there's not enough, I can do certain things to feed them in an emergency feeding situation. Now, another concern now, obviously, there's been so much talk about different pests and diseases that are impacting honeybees. Do those tend to be worse when we've had a milder winter? I suspect that they can be. Uh, I'm not certain on that. Um, but I would think that a milder winter allows more bees to live in that hive. And if any of them have mites, like varroa mites, which are a carrier or a pathogen, we call it, for disease, then we may have higher mite loads. We'd say more mites in a hive come springtime, which could uh, bring on those diseases. Mm. So we're talking about honeybees here, but of course we have our native bees also that are dealing with an El Nino winter. And uh, as things have gone, we may see things like red maple blooming earlier this year or winter aconite or many of these different types of plants that are going to produce that first uh, pollen source. So uh, again, the bees, uh, Don, are going to have to be just like us uh let nature take its course i would think so and i think that the bees are able to do that almost better than we are letting nature take its course they're adaptive Uh, they're able to adapt to the kind of weather that they're having at that time so and the plants too are responding like you said the uh the maple, some of the soft maples, like the silver maple, sure. they may be blooming here in a sheltered location. I wouldn't be surprised to see a silver maple already starting to bloom a little bit. So yeah. if the bees get a flight day, they can a warm day where they can fly from the hive, they can find that pollen there, or they can go to skunk cabbage, which is probably blooming right now. Um, so those types of things should be available. The willows are some early forage sure. plants. Um, you mentioned aconite, winter aconite snowdrops as well. We've seen them blooming. Um, sure. So things like that are available. Well, you know, bees are on our minds uh, because we're all anxious for spring. And of course, in California, they have the annual almond tree blossom in February and March. Uh, They call it the world's largest pollination event. And, uh, boy, they don't have enough uh, native colonies of honeybees in California. And so they got to bring in a a lot of bees from elsewhere, correct, Don? They do, yes. So many what we call migratory beekeepers, which are beekeepers that have hives of bees, and then they migrate or bring them to different areas of the country when certain types of plants are blooming. Now it's almonds now, or if we were from Northern California, what would we say? Almonds instead, (laughs) right? (laughs) Right. (laughs) But but, um, it's a sight to see, I guess. The white blossoms in the orchards of almonds are, are pretty astounding, but they need to bring in hives and hives of bees by the truckload. So imagine that <laughs> yeah yeah that is that is crazy you know i'm yeah. i'm always fascinated by bees uh, stacy i know you love insects and studying insects and you know some of the reading i had done this past winter talked about pollen stealing in other words uh, in italy they have observed honeybees snatching pollen off the backs of bumblebees and then Honeybees also having, uh, you know, a, a remarkable ability to adjust their flight behavior when they're hauling a load of nectar so they don't overheat. Bees just are simply done fascinating, and I think that's why we're, we're drawn to them. Not only the importance of bees in our landscape, uh, but just the fascination with them. Exactly. And I think they're probably the most studied insect studied by humans. And you can see why. I mean, I'm, I've got 18 years of beekeeping under the belt now, and still I'm fascinated uh, when I learn something new, like you just mentioned, where 
honeybees are stealing pollen off the backs or from the back legs of a bumblebee. Yeah. You know, it just <laughs> stuff like that. It makes you shake your head or, or what you just talked about, about how the bees are adapting their flight behavior when they're loaded with pollen so that they don't overheat. Well, that's remarkable. But I almost just nod my head and smile and think, I'm not surprised anymore, you know? Yeah. Yeah, the, exactly. the truth is stranger than fiction when it comes to honeybees. It's totally remarkable. That's so true. Yeah, and we're all trying to find ways to support the bees. Of course, the concept of no mo may was started in the United States um, in Appleton, Wisconsin, as I understand it. Uh, the city suspended their weed ordinances for the month of May. Uh, but in Florida, I have found that no mo may has been adapted to no mo march. And Stacy, it does sure. bring up the point that there are many things that we can do for bees, including, as we do on this show, encouraging people to plant more flowers. Things that we can do and things we cannot do, like mow, and, and look at the things around us and not judge them as weeds or nuisances, but mm -hmm. as a food source for bees and the other insects around us that are actually really important. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, we have no shave November, right? Why not? <laughs> Why not no more May? <laughs> Love it. It's all the buzz, Don. It is. Yeah. Yeah. So you're looking forward to the spring season. We're looking forward to some of these plants uh, starting to bloom. What are, What's the hot buzz, the, the, uh, the news in the whole bee world and beekeeping world that uh, we're going to hear a lot about in 2024? Boy, that's a question <laughs> that I have no idea. Okay. Sometimes these things just evolve, mm -hmm. and we find something that um, that we didn't know before. And I think that's terrific, too. I know they're working hard at some of the pathogens. Like, there's one of the fowl broods, we call it. I mean, this is kind of the dark side of beekeeping, but it's European fowl brood, for example, uh, there are people that are studying that and trying to figure out ways that we can uh, eliminate it from our hives. And it's exciting for me to see that happening because I've struggled with that. My bees have struggled with that particular disease. So, yeah, it's been, I actually involve some of the people at Michigan State University that are working on this study just to see what I can learn from them as well. So that gives me some hope. And, and I think, yeah, that's good news. Stacy, when you visit uh, Don at his house, I've been to Don's house and <laughs> he gets you a bar stool and you pull that bar stool up to the bar and then he starts getting <laughs> out bottles of various types of honey and uh, some wooden sticks and you start tasting honey. It is amazing contingent on the plant species mm. that the bee used or the time of year, the variance in the flavor of that honey. It's amazing. Yeah, plants are so incredible. And, you know, it's just, I think that when even when we have extremes like this that maybe get us a little bit concerned about what's going to happen, they're also learning opportunities. Sure. And, you know, it's like what exactly. Donna's saying is we don't know, you know, what's going to happen when we have such a mild winter. Is this going to be better or worse for varroa mites? Is this going to be better or worse for European fowl brood? And even though, you know, we might have our anxieties and concerns about weather like this and about seasons like this, there's also a learning opportunity that we can hopefully take away from it and, you know, a apply in, in different, more normal times. Yeah. Yeah. So true. And I think we can take a lesson from the bees and their adaptivity, mm -hmm. their ability to adapt to certain situations. And I think we can adapt as well. Well, we can take a lesson from you, Don. Thank you for what you do in educating people throughout the year on bees. Uh, very, very important work. We celebrate it. Uh, and we thank you for what you do. Don, if people want to learn more about you, what website should they go to? They can go to thornapplewoodlands.com and see what we do. We do a lot of educational programs at schools and libraries, things like that. And any event where there are people gathered and they want to learn either about honeybees or about maple syrup. And we've added fishing, the basics mm -hmm. of fishing, whether it's open water or ice fishing. 
Oh boy, that that kind of hurts my heart to talk about ice fishing right now. <laughs> it was not a good year. A good, <laughs> not a good winter for that. Not a good year, but, but maybe on a future show we could chat worms if that's something you'd like hey, to talk about. You know, I just started worm farming or whatever we call it when we raise worms but i started with european night crawlers outstanding and yep and i also uh got some composting worms as well which will be smaller than the night crawlers but they're in two separate bins and it's been totally amazing to me to see how the night crawlers have grown and now they're starting to multiply in there and oh it's just a thrill for me so and well, it, they'll good yeah they'll produce compost uh, worm castings right which right. is and which is terrific for the garden and also fishing bait for me if i want to go bluegill fishing so it'll be hard for me to use one of my worms as bait now because there's <laughs> I'm starting to get attached to them. <laughs> <laughs> well, I had to wiggle that in there, Don. And yeah, sometime thank you. We will talk worms. His name is awesome. Don Snoink. It's Thornapple Woodlands. And Don, thank you so much for joining us on the Gardening Simplified Show. It's been a pleasure, and I thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you. Thanks, Don. Please tell the bees and worms that Rick, Adriana, and I say hello. All righty, will do. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you for this. Thank you. So that's all we have time for today. We want to thank you all so much for listening. Thank you, Rick. Thanks to Adriana. And again, thank you all for listening. We hope you have a wonderful week ahead.